The surveillance footage you're witnessing here is the last few moments of Lily Sullivan's life. She recently turned 18 and was eager to experience everything adult life had to offer. On December 16th, 2021, Lily was out with friends at the Paddles nightclub in Pembroke, Wales, when she met 31-year-old Lewis Haynes. The two hit it off immediately and hung out for most of the night, dancing, laughing, and flirting. At around 2 a.m. that morning, Lily and Lewis left the club together in search of a bit of privacy before her mom was due to pick her up at 3 a.m. They walked to a nearby alleyway, which was secluded and unlit, giving them the privacy they had wanted. At 2.45, Lily's mom arrived and called her to let her know that she was waiting at a nearby gas station. Lily assured her mom that she was on her way and that she would be there in a couple of minutes. However, as the minutes ticked by without Lily's arrival, her mom grew increasingly concerned. She tried calling Lily a total of 30 times, but all of her calls went unanswered. At 3.08 a.m., Lewis is seen running across the bridge of the Pembroke Mill Pond, and two minutes later he reaches the very same gas station where Lily's mom was anxiously awaiting her daughter's arrival. Her mom immediately notices Lewis, sensing something peculiar about his behavior. He shakes his head a few times and even holds his head in his hands, exhibiting signs of unease. At one point, he turns back and makes direct eye contact with her before continuing onward and disappearing into the nearby woods. Unbeknownst to Lily's mom, the man she had just made eye contact with was the very same man who had murdered her daughter a couple of minutes earlier. This is the heartbreaking case of Lily Sullivan. Lily Sullivan was an 18-year-old resident of Pembroke, Wales. She was described as a beautiful girl inside and out, although Lily herself remained blissfully unaware of how beautiful she really was. She was a talented artist, had a love of tattoos, and especially loved house music. Her friends admired her for being mature and well-spoken beyond her years, as well as for her ability to see the best in people. Lily was also an advocate against misogyny, sexual violence, and the gruesome crime of femicide, often using her Instagram account to raise awareness and speak out against the darkness that plagued society, never imagining that she would ultimately become a victim of the very atrocities she fought against. In 2021, Lily Sullivan was 18 years old. She had recently started attending college and was also working part-time at a supermarket. Embracing the newfound independence that accompanied her transition into adulthood, she began exploring the vibrant nightlife of the clubs and pubs in Pembroke, as the legal drinking age in Wales is 18. While Lily's mother understood and supported her daughter's desire to experience the world, she remained ever vigilant and fiercely protective over Lily. Regardless of the hour, her mom made it a point to always pick Lily up after a night out, ensuring that her safety remained paramount. This unwavering commitment stemmed from a deep-rooted connection forged through a challenging journey. Her mother had endured the heart-wrenching pain of 14 miscarriages before Lily was born, making her presence all the more cherished. On December 16, 2021, Lily and some friends went to the Paddles nightclub in Pembroke in search of a fun night out. During the course of the evening, she met 31-year-old Lewis Haynes, who was also out with friends for the night. He was an oil refinery worker and a well-known cricket player from the area, who enjoyed celebrating his team's victories with a good party. Throughout the night, Lewis had shown a particular interest in Lily, even though his friends reminded him to steer clear. Lewis was actually in a committed relationship and living with his girlfriend at the time. He even had a child from a previous relationship, and at the time he was engaged in a custody battle over his child in family court. His friends tried to remind him of his existing responsibilities, and at the same time cautioned him against pursuing Lily, as she was much younger than him. Although Lily was 18 years old and of legal age at the time, she was 13 years younger than Lewis. His friend's thoughtful reminders to try and keep him on track fell on deaf ears, and Lewis continued to make the moves on Lily. They were seen dancing, flirting, and even kissing at some point during the night, and it was clear that they were both attracted to each other. At around 2 a.m., the two agreed to leave the club together in search of a more quiet spot. CCTV cameras capture them leaving the Paddles nightclub, Nothing seems out of the ordinary. They walk toward an unlit alleyway just down the road from the nightclub, and this is where things got a bit more intimate. Lily's mom called her at 2.47 a.m., and Lily told her that she would be with her in a couple of minutes. It's believed that it's at this point that Lily stopped Lewis from taking things any further, 
and she told him that she didn't want to finish what they started. Lewis, who was someone who believed himself to be a bit of a ladies' man, didn't like being rejected, so he decided that he wouldn't take no for an answer. He grabbed Lily's phone from her and continued to force himself on her, while her mom was desperately trying to reach her. In court, it would later be revealed that on CCTV footage which has not been released to the public, grainy footage of Lewis and Lily was seen in the alleyway, and the cameras could see Lily's phone lighting up while her mom tried to call her. Lewis would later tell the court that it was at this point that Lily threatened to tell everyone that he sexually assaulted her, so out of panic and fear of losing custody of his child, he decided to strangle her in an attempt to keep her quiet. The alleyway opened up into the entrance of the mill pond, so despite not knowing if Lily was definitely dead, he still took her body and dumped her in the pond. After fleeing the scene and passing Lily's mom at the gas station, Lewis made his way through the woods and continued to his house. When he arrived home, he immediately told his girlfriend that he had strangled someone and that he'd been in the mill pond. He then convinced his girlfriend to immediately drive him to his parents' house, and when they got there, he confessed to killing Lily. He told his parents how he had met Lily at the club and even how he strangled her and dumped her body. His dad then drove with him to the mill pond, and it was there that they came across the lifeless body of Lily Sullivan. Lewis's dad called the police at 4.12 a.m., telling them about the body of a young woman in the pond. Despite emergency services attempting to resuscitate Lily, she was unfortunately pronounced dead at 6.02 a.m. She was found naked from the waist up, with her lace top laying next to the water. Her leather jacket and cell phone would later be found in the nearby alleyway. Police arrested Lewis Haynes shortly after discovering the body, and when they apprehended him, he told them that he had strangled Lily. That same day, Lewis Haynes was charged with the murder of Lily Sullivan. In May 2022, Lewis Haynes informed the court that he was willing to plead guilty to manslaughter, but not the more severe charge of murder. He felt that his attack wasn't premeditated and that he acted out in the moment. But as the trial continued and more evidence came to light, Lewis realized that the evidence against him was overwhelming, so he informed the judge in June 2022 that he now wants to plead guilty to murder. During sentencing proceedings, the defense requested a minimum term of 15 years before being eligible for parole. They highlighted that Lily had not been raped and that Lewis immediately showed remorse by confessing to his action and taking accountability. The Crown, however, requested that he be sentenced to a minimum term of 30 years. They said that although Lily hadn't been raped, there was a sexual element involved in the crime. They pointed out that Lily was found naked from the waist up and that her shirt was found next to the water. They said that there was no doubt that Lewis was the one who removed Lily's shirt against her will. They said that although Lily willingly went with Lewis to the alleyway and that there no doubt was a degree of intimacy between them, it was clear that Lily didn't want it to lead to intercourse. This was evident in the fact that she agreed to leave the very moment her mom called. They said that Lewis couldn't handle the rejection, and that's when he decided to physically assault Lily. On August 26, 2022, Lewis Haynes was found guilty of the murder of Lily Sullivan. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 23 years before being considered for parole. During the victim impact statement, Lily's mom said the following, I wish I could go back in time and stop Lily from going out that night. I wish I could have protected her from the evil that she met that night. When I saw the man responsible for her death at the garage, I wish I had confronted him. Knowing that I was that close to her, I wish I'd have got out of my car and walked to her. Lily needed me. I always wonder if I could have saved her. I sincerely hope that whatever it was you wanted so badly that you felt the need to murder my son was worth the next at least 52 years of your continued existence. You won't get the luxury of raising your child because you took mine away. Yes, sir. Mr. Wright, what would you like to say? I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon or I'll be Keon. and I love my family. That's all you got to say. You know, I have um, never in 23 years of approximately ever not accepted a sentence agreement between the parties because it's bargained for, sentenced by the parties. But watching you sit there, smile and laugh and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement. We'll go to trial. And if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. That's what I'm tempted to do. Breaking
news, the family of the boy who went missing after jumping off of a cruise ship has went to search for him and Bahamian officials have provided an update. 18-year-old Cameron Robbins disappeared last Wednesday after being dared to jump off of a sunset cruise in the Bahamas. A video surfaced of Cameron jumping where you could see a life preserver was thrown to him and as he was swimming to it, he turned away because of a figure in the water. Many believe it was a shark that pulled him under. In an update earlier this week, the Royal Bahamas Defense Force said that where he went overboard is, quote, really shark infested. This week, his family visited the area he disappeared. The United Cajun Navy Vice President said that the family traveled to the Bahamas to retrace his last moments. He said, quote, it took a lot of strength for them to go out there and stay for a few days. When we offered to take them out in a boat to the area where he went overboard and some of the area they were searching, they went. He said it must have been very emotional for them and by Sunday they decided they wanted to go home. He said that if they would have found any piece of clothing or clue that they would have extended the 48 hour search. However, they didn't get any indication and that is when they usually call it off. They said some of the family members included his mom, dad, brother and sister. After visiting the search site, his family paid tribute to him by saying that he was adopted shortly after birth in November of 2004. They said he liked to participate in every competitive activity that he could find. Eventually he chose baseball as his final love and that he was a pitcher. It has officially been nine days since he disappeared. I'll keep you guys updated. What do you think? Drop in the comments. So this is the true story of how my childhood friend, Skylar Niece, was unalived by her two best friends. The night of July 5th, 2012, Skylar snuck out of her parents' apartment to go on a joy ride with her two best friends, Rachel and Sheila. She snuck out around 11 o'clock or midnight and she went down the street and met them in Sheila's car. They're from Morgantown, West Virginia, which is like a hop, skip, and a jump to Pennsylvania, so they ended up going on a joy ride to PA. They ended up driving about an hour into Pennsylvania, and what Skylar thought they were doing was just smoking and going on a joy ride. And that's not what happened at all. They ended up pulling over in the woods in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and they all hopped out of the car to smoke. And this is where everything goes south. We were all three out of the car, and then Skylar said she had to go back into the car to get something. She turns to go back to the car, and Sheila and Rachel look at each other, and they take out that Sheila had provided, and they go one, two, three, and proceeded to attack Skylar. She was over 50 times. Her final word, which literally breaks my heart, was why? After that, Sheila and Rachel brought a change of clothes and a shovel in the trunk. They wanted to bury her, but the ground was too hard, so they ended up taking her and piling leaves and branches on top of her. And if that's not heartbreaking enough, what they did next was literally psychotic, insane, and just absolutely unreal. This will make your hair stand straight up. Ted Bundy, among a few other notorious psychopaths, are quoted to have said that they could pick their victims just based on how they walked. Ted Bundy once said, and I quote, I could tell a victim by how she walked down the street, the tilt of her head, the way that she carried herself. Scientific studies have proven that people with high levels of antisocial or psychopathic personality traits are more perceptive than the average person toward body language and can pick up on cues that most of us miss. This is a predatory skill that they develop so that they can pick out who's vulnerable, who's weak, who won't fight back, who could possibly be a victim. And that got me thinking as a woman, how do I carry myself when I'm out in the world? Do I carry myself in a way that looks defeated, scared, nervous, or do I carry myself in a way that says, I dare you? So I thought I'd give you a few visual examples examples of what could be interpreted as victim body language and how you can remedy that to look more like somebody that a man wouldn't want to mess with. So the first example of body language that can be interpreted by a predator as weak or as a potential victim would be just simply how you stand. So if you're standing on one hip like this and your head's kind of down, your feet are not firmly planted. You could be easily knocked off balance. So stand with your feet planted whenever you're standing at a, at a shopping mall or if you're in line at the checkout. Hold yourself with some purpose. Keep your feet planted and let people know just non-verbally, I am aware of my surroundings. My feet are on the ground. You you can't knock me off balance. You can't jerk me around. My hips and my feet aren't going anywhere. Another prime example is how you walk. If you're leaving a supermarket or you're walking to your car, how are you presenting yourself to the world that is observing you? Do you have your shoulders forward? Do you have your phone in your hand? Is your head down? Do you have earbuds in where you can't hear what's going on around you? And again, are you standing maybe like this where you're off balance, your hips and your feet are not planted? How are you walking? Look at this. Versus this. 
Walk like you've got somewhere to be. Keep your head up. Keep your eyes open. Keep your head moving to where you can express to people that are observing your body language that I am aware of my surroundings. If somebody's over there, I see you. I see you. Walk with purpose. Stand with purpose. Be mindful of how you are presenting yourself to the world around you. Breaking news out of Virginia, a man was captured on video touching a nine-year-old girl inappropriately on a cruise ship. And to beat it all, the nine-year-old girl was his daughter, and he's actually a member of the Sheriff's Department in Franklin County. The affidavit states, on or about May 26, 2023, Justin Sigmund and his family were in a dining room of the ship waiting for dinner to be served. When a good Samaritan observes Sigmund, his nine-year-old female relative. So this witness was sitting at a table directly adjacent from the table that Justin and his family were sitting at so she could see everything perfectly. Witness one indicated that she observed that the minor, which is the nine-year-old daughter, it's done been released, was sitting in her father's lap for about 10 minutes and he was rubbing her upper thigh and inner thigh moving towards her. The witness then began to record the incident on their phone and the incident was also recorded on the ship's surveillance footage. The affidavit states that he was rubbing her leg and stuff underneath of her skirt. During several points of the touching, the minor victim pushed Sigmund's hand away. Despite the effort, Sigmund continued to touch the minor victim's upper and inner thighs. I mean, this little girl even tried to cross her legs and he still tried to touch her. And when she finally got up, Sigmund immediately placed both of his hands over his area for an extended period of time, concealing the area from public view. It's just so heartbreaking because it's being reported that when they interviewed the little girl, she said that he wasn't touching her up there, that he was touching her below her knee in her calf area and that he never went up underneath of her skirt. But the recordings show that she was not telling the truth. Gamal and I dated for roughly a year before I found out I was pregnant. And it was somewhat of a surprise. It was nothing that was planned. And once I heard that little heartbeat, I was instantly in love. You know, it started turning into one of those things where if my mom babysat him one night when we went out, then his mom had to babysit him the next week. And my mom wasn't going to get more time than his mom. As Gavin got older, it just it turned into... Um, having to account for where we were or how long we were gone or how long we were going to be at my mom's, how long we were going to be at my friend's house. Is that really where you're at? I told them all that if I was ever going to be able to move forward with my life, I was going to have to get a restraining order against him because he was crazy. And he pulled me off the couch and I hit my head on the floor and he drugged me into the kitchen and got on top of me and started to strangle me. Gamal was always worried about if I was dating and who I was dating and who I was with. And that's what the argument was about. He wanted to know where I had been um, while he had Gavin over the weekend. He took my phone and wanted to look through the phone. And he put the phone in the bathroom um, in the hallway upstairs. Um, after he put the phone down, we began to argue about who I was talking to on the phone. And he started to hit me. Gavin came running out of his room and asked, What are you doing, my mom? And when he saw Gavin, he picked him up and he took Gavin to the master bedroom and said, it's okay, son, just stay here. And he put the TV on for him and his demeanor towards Gavin was very calm. I mean, it was daddy. I was just like, okay, at that point I knew something really bad was gonna happen today. He came up towards me slowly to where I, I was backing myself into the corner in the hallway. He punched me in my arms and more in the torso, and I mean, I'm, I'm just shocked. At that point, he stepped back and he punched me between my eyes with all his might. And I fell to the floor. And when I looked down, I saw that there was blood everywhere. Um, there was blood down my face, my mouth, everywhere. Gamal pulled out a gun from his waistband. And he said three things. He said, we were all going to die today, that we would die as a family, and that nobody else was going to raise our son. I knew I needed to call 911. I had to find a way to get to my phone. So I went into the bathroom that he'd left the phone in, and I rinsed my face, and I dialed 911 to let it just play so that they could hear what was going on. And as I walked out of the bathroom, I yelled really loud, look what you did to my face. I knew I needed to call 911. I had to find a way to get to my phone. So I went into the bathroom that he'd left the phone in and I rinsed my face and I dialed 911 to let it just play so that they could hear what was going on. 
And as I walked out of the bathroom, I yelled really loud, look what you did to my face, so that 911 would already know I'd been hit. And at that point, I realized how bad it was. I mean, it was split down to the bone. And it seems like immediately there was a ring, at the doorbell rang. And Gamal said, did you call the cops? And I told him, you have my phone. There's no way that I could have called the cops. Um, so he takes me at gunpoint into the spare bedroom, which faces the front of the house, and the cops were outside. And Gamal opened the window, and he waved the gun, and he told the cops that they had till the count of 10 to get out of there, or that he was going to kill his family. When we got downstairs, there was a gas can um, to the right of the staircase, and our kitchen was to the right, the living room was to the left. So Gamal began to douse the kitchen in gasoline. At this point, I'm just screaming, don't do this with Gavin upstairs by himself. Let me get the baby. Gamal is just telling me to shut the F up, shut up. And he insisted that he was not going to get Gavin, just to shut up. I had to make a move. This was the only way I was gonna get him away from Gavin. I knew I was gonna die. I, I knew I was gonna die, but I also knew I was gonna die saving my son. So I ran and I made sure to slam the door behind me so that it could create a barrier and give me a chance to get ahead of him. Um, when I got to the end of the driveway, I realized the cops were gone. I had seen them would seem like 30 seconds prior and they were gone. I'm running and I, I hear a very loud bang. And I, I know that it felt like rocks were being thrown at my back. I was shot once in the arm. I was shot a couple of times in my back. I was shot twice on my side. I was shot in the buttocks, but I just kept running. I just kept running until somebody would help me. And I told her a couple more times just to call 911, but I didn't want to leave until I knew they had gotten Gavin out. And that was the last thing I remember saying to her before waking up in the ambulance. came in to see me a couple of days after I'd been awake and the first two things that I had asked were where's Gamal because I was afraid that he was gonna come back and where Gavin was I was told that they were both deceased and I just I didn't believe it a, a couple of days after I'd been awake and the first two things that I had asked were where's Gamal because I was afraid that he was going to come back and where Gavin was. I was told that they were both deceased. And I just, I didn't believe it. I had to be told numerous times that they were both gone. I was told that Gamal was able to let off 11 to 12 rounds. He shot Gavin once in the head. And he shot himself right here. I survived because I have to keep my son's memory alive. I have to keep his name alive. My family needs me. I can't imagine what, what my family would have gone through to lose both of us. Gavin was an amazing child. It's difficult to try to sum him up in a couple of words, but I tell everybody he was really special. And I don't say that just because he was mine. He was smart, he was gorgeous. Um, he was really intelligent and full of life. He was just a vibrant, vibrant little soul, full of life.